live. Yesterday's YouTube link did not work at all. Today's worked like a charm. You know, we don't have control over our lives. We're all stuck at home. We're dependent on technology companies for our safety, security, and sense of well being. But today it is a bright, sunny day in Washington, D.C., but not too hot. All is right with the universe. And of course, that means the YouTube link works beautifully. It is uh, June 12th, 2020, 5.02 p.m. And this is the 78th day in a row that in the five o'clock hour we have brought you in lieu of fun because we are not allowed to have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun today, we have Catherine Rampell of the Washington Post, who has the distinction of being the person who overlapped with me on the Washington Post editorial page for one day. I think uh, I came to the Washington Post editorial. I was leaving the Washington Post editorial page as Catherine was showing up. I believe we interacted once. Uh, uh, and then uh, the next time I and saw- And I drove her, you away. And that's right. And I, we, I said, no more. Um, <laughs> that, that's exactly what happened. Um, uh, and Catherine has gone on uh, to be uh, uh, one of the most interesting opinion writers on, on issues of economics uh, and lots of other stuff. She did theater reviews for a while, which I thought was a really cool thing. Um, and her column in the Washington Post is one that I seldom miss, which is not something I generally say about columns, which is a form that I have come to dislike in general. Um, but I love Catherine's column. And uh, so we're going to get to that. Okay. Um, and but before we do, Catherine, I have just a basic question about the economy for you, because you're somebody I trust on economic issues. How fucked are we? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not sure that that's, you know, a technical term. Um, Seems pretty technical. Oh, it's definitely a technical it's term. For some things, it's a technical term. <laughs> Look, there's so much uncertainty right now that it's a little bit hard to say. The forecasts are all over the map. If you look at like what the Congressional Budget Office has said, they've basically said that we're going to have really high unemployment at least through the end of 2021. Um, and the Fed, I think, expected that we would have 9% unemployment in the fourth quarter of this year. So the numbers look bad. They look like they're going to be bad for a long time. Um, and that's troubling, particularly since there doesn't seem to be a lot of like get up and go uh, spirit in, or whatever the expression is in Congress right now to do something about any of that. You know, there's like in these long dragged out talks about um, about another round of relief slash stimulus, but it's not clear if or when that is happening. I mean, probably it will happen, but there, there doesn't seem to be um, a lot of rush to get it done anytime soon. And that's really what I'm most concerned about is that we've already had a lot of damage to the economy so far. And um, there could be a lot more coming down the pike at this point because states are broke. States and cities are broke. Um, we've, I think they, I think the last I looked, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but it was like state and local governments had laid off something like a million teachers, um, just in the last couple of months, uh, let alone other kinds of public sector employees. And a lot of states and cities had their fiscal year turning around quite soon. Um, and you could expect more layoffs to come. One of the lessons that we learned from the great recession was that you had this sort of second wave of um, financial pain that came from strapped states and cities because um, the federal government didn't provide enough support to them. So like, there are things we could do right now for us to be less effed, um, but uh, 
you know, we don't really seem so motivated to be doing them or to be doing them anytime soon. So you could like have this domino effect um, in the months or quarters ahead. Businesses lay off workers. There are fewer tax revenues going to states. States lay off workers. They cut services. They cut contracts with private businesses. Private businesses lay off more workers, et cetera. So, you know, there are a lot of variables, but the way things are going doesn't look Pretty super bad. encouraging. But then again, last month we had a much better jobs report than anyone expected. So, yeah, that was but, weird. That yeah. seemed like no one ever made sense of that. Is that correct? Like, I read as much as I possibly could. And everything that I read was saying, we don't know why this is happening, why there's been this pickup in jobs. Is that, is that accurate? Like that seemed to be like, by like, what, what is your take on that? I, I think the bottom line is that there was going to be a pickup in hiring at some point in the near future. Probably most people, most economists, most forecasters, I would say, thought it was going to happen like in June or maybe July, that basically you wouldn't have anything close to a full recovery, but you would have as this, as states lift lockdown orders and, and as businesses start to reopen, you would have some hiring. And it just came a little bit sooner than had been widely expected. Um, part of the reason why the consensus seemed to be that it wasn't going to happen quite yet was that if you look at the unemployment insurance claims, they're still really, really high. But the problem with judging what's going on with the job market solely from unemployment insurance claims is that that tells you, well, A, it's, it's supposed to tell you how many people are getting laid off. It doesn't tell you how many, what's happening on the other side of the ledger, right? How many people are getting new jobs? Um, so you know the, the gross number, you don't know the net number. Um, and then B, you know, there was probably a, a pretty large backlog because states are still running on software like from the 1970s and a lot of unemployed workers were having trouble getting through and actually filing for unemployment. So some of the reason why those um, unemployment claim numbers were really high and, and made people think that there was still a lot of uh, layoffs happening may just be because states were clearing the backlog. Um, but I mean, I think the bottom line for the jobs report is that, yes, it showed that we turned a corner a little bit sooner than expected, which is good. But if you look at how deeply we are in the hole, we are very, very deeply in the hole. Um, I'm a really, sorry, I don't want to, Ben, if you have a question, go ahead, but you're muted. I'm, I muted myself because uh, one of the inevitable Washington loafing helicopters is passing over my head. Mm. So this oh is my actually God, I can hear it. Fast. I can hear it. Yes, it's, it's buzzing us. Okay, so Ben's uh, so Ben's indisposed because of a low flying helicopter uh, slash drone outside his, his house. The, the government clearly doesn't want to hear what I have to say. Yeah, I know, yeah, right? Yeah. That's how I feel all the time. Mm-hmm. But the um, but I was gonna say, Catherine, I'm really interested to hear more about this because um, there has been a thought that there would be an increase in jobs but not jobs that existed before. So for instance, like our local, not local, like the the local stop and shop, like it's about like 30 minutes away. And like, you know, it's the biggest like stop and shop around here or like kind of grocery store around here. They're, they've canceled their like delivery, their Peapod delivery and all this stuff. And they have in people, in-person people working in the grocery store and they've opened this up. But I kind of like had this moment of like, well, why are they laying off workers if there's so many more people wanting groceries and then there is um, seems to be like people would pay a premium for delivery or for having their pack, like all of their groceries packed up for them or people shopping for them in all of these various places. And the reason I mentioned that is like, I'm in a rural area right now. I came from Brooklyn. I'm now in a rural area, but that's true in both of those places. It just seems like that that would be like, it's like, and so I've been curious about how that would play out in a market setting for jobs. So I don't know what the hiring numbers are in grocery stores right now. That is a noble, that is a noble answer. That is something I can look up and I can do it in a second while we're on this uh, uh, call if you'd like. But um, I can say that uh, I'm in New York and it seems like here, 
a lot of the grocery stores have been increasing their delivery options. Like a few weeks ago, it was very difficult to get delivery. You had to book a week in advance or you couldn't get slots at all. And now it's much easier, at least in my neighborhood. So I don't, you know, it's hard to know whether I can really extrapolate elsewhere. Again, this is, there are, uh, you know, nat national data um, available that I can look up. Um, I will say that, like, you know, the, the economics of a lot of these industries have changed. Even if there's more demand from customers, um, the costs of running a business, whether it's a grocery store or um, a warehouse or whatever, you know, things where there's more demand for whatever it is you're selling, those costs have gone up too because you have to buy equipment for your, or you should be buying equipment for your employees, you know, PPE to keep them safe. You may need to clean more frequently. Um, you may need to have fewer people on any given shift than had been the case. Uh, so, you know, it's possible that their margins have been squeezed that way. I mean, the prices of the things that grocery stores are, are stocking have been going up, um, you know, in part because of supply chain disruptions at places like meat packing plants, meat processing plants, and um, whether or not stores can actually pass along those costs to customers is, is not actually a given. Will people be willing to absorb, um, you know, a 20% uh, higher spike in, in beef prices, for example? So there are a lot of factors going on beyond just there are cu customers who want this thing that this store is selling. And it's not always totally visible, right, to the consumer. Um, but I, I think a lot of businesses are really struggling with how do they deal with these margins. Um, and I wonder what's going to happen with uh, the restaurant industry, for example. You know, they're in a lot of cities, they're being told, well, you can you can open, you can operate, but at limited capacity and like their business model just may not work <laughs> that way. It's, it's going to become a luxury good, perhaps, to go to a to go to a restaurant. Go ahead, That's Ben. Right. Sorry. So I want to go back to your point of, that you started with about the slow pace of the next phase of recovery legislation. And I'm bewildered by this because it actually seems quite self-destructive from the point of view of Republican congressional leadership. And I'm, I'm interested in your, uh, your A, your read, your read on the politics of it, first of all, but also your, you know, your your sense of whether my sense of it is uh, sort of over the top. And my my sense is we learned in the Great Recession that uh, in a pretty dramatic fashion that austerity, uh, you know, in the sort of austerity versus Keynesian debate the Keynesians win, mm -hmm. right? The countries that did more faster with less regard for long-term fiscal issues did better than the countries that, you know, tightened belts, uh, except for Germany, um, right? Germany. Um, they, they, yeah, there are some weird things going on there because of the Euro, but yes. Right, but, but, but basically austerity sucked and that the sense in which the Obama uh, uh, bailouts were and the late Bush bailouts were successful was directly proportional to their size. And this, the sense in which they were insufficiently successful was because they were not really that big or re not really that big relative to, to need. And so you look at it now and you say, okay, this is a, uh, a, a, a more dramatic financial event, or maybe a less dramatic financial event, but a more dramatic economic catastrophe. And Congress does three quick rounds in a very bipartisan fashion. And then all of a sudden, Mitch McConnell says, okay, I've had enough. And he does that in the run up to an election uh, in which the result of it is going to be that lots of people, as you described, these cascading effects happen in the run up to an election. And so my question, since you uh, clearly understand the depths of Mitch McConnell's soul in a way that I do not, 
I'm my sure question is, what the heck is, what the heck is he thinking? Like this just seems like a total self-inflicted wound for Republicans, and he could muddy the waters dramatically by just kind of doing the right thing. It would be good for the economy. It would be good for recovery. It would be good for the president's reelect. It would be good for Senate Republicans. What's he thinking? Uh, it's genuinely perplexing. You know, I think the standard media narrative has been that. Democrats are rooting for a continued bust and Republicans are rooting for a boom, right? That they're, they, they want the country to reopen quickly. They want economic activity to pick up. And they think, you know, both sides think that the fate of the economy is going to help determine the fate of the election. But if you look at the actual policy agendas they're putting together, it, it's very much in conflict with that narrative because it, Democrats are proposing much more fiscal spending um, they're proposing ex extending enhanced unemployment benefits, uh, which were not designed perfectly by any means. Um, but you know, unemployment is is still if you capture all of the people who are underemployed right now and probably misclassified in the last jobs report, for example, it's probably about a quarter of the population is uh, insufficiently employed, shall we say, right now. The idea of um, you know, not extending unemployment benefits uh, under those conditions just seems absurd to me. But so Democrats are calling for that. Um, they're also calling for fiscal relief for states and cities, which, by the way, is being demanded not just by blue states and blue cities. If you look at the, um, the what is it called, the National Governors Association or, um, you know, various organizations that are like consortiums of mayors or state legislatures or whatever, they're all saying, please give us money. Um, we, we're deeply in the red. We're gonna have to lay off all sorts of people we don't wanna lay off right now. Um, you know, help us out of this crisis. It's, it's, it's not just blue states, it's blue, red, and purple that need the help. Democrats are calling for that as well. And then you have, on the other hand, Republicans, uh, Republican leadership, I should say, uh, dragging their feet or even suggesting that they don't wanna do, they don't, they don't want to spend any more money. They are willing to do more tax cuts. <laughs> um, you've, I've heard a, you know, a number of proposals floated for various kinds of tax cuts, including more capital gains tax cuts, which would do nothing to stimulate the economy, um, you know, various other kinds of corporate side tax cuts or a payroll tax cut um, on the employee side. There are a bunch of tax cut related policies, but for some reason there's this sort of like mental block related to spending. Um, I have to say, in some way, in, in one particular way, uh, <laughs> encouraging is not the right word. It does make me think that maybe they actually believe the sort of austerity or whatever, the, the anti-spending rhetoric that they were spouting during the Obama years that at the time, cynical me, I thought they were just saying because they actually wanted to sabotage the economy under Obama. You know, no way that they would actually believe that we need to cut back on spending um, or uh, let unemployment benefits run out, which we did multiple times in the aftermath of the Great Recession. No way that they think this is good economic policy, that this will be good for the economy. They're really just trying to like, you know, sabotage the recovery and make Obama look bad. And maybe in fact, they just are genuinely confused about what's good for the economy. I don't know. I don't know what's going through Mitch McConnell's head. Um, I think in the end, there will probably be some cash infusion to states and cities, but I don't know how quickly and I don't know how much damage is gonna be done up until then. Um, Do you think there's gonna be another stimulus check to to like to citizens? Um, I think it's unclear at this point. I, I don't know that there's a ton of momentum behind that particular idea, but I don't think it's been ruled out. Uh, I think Mnuchin indicated, I should go back and look at his actual comments, but you know, he testified this week and he talked a little bit about some of these different ideas. And I think he indicated that it would be on the table, but I don't remember exactly how he phrased it. So uh, how do you understand the Trump administration's position in this? Because if I were Donald Trump, and I, I, let's leave aside Donald Trump because, you know, there you're dealing with uh, 
I don't know whether you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with thought disturbance that can really <laughs> disrupt them. But Mnuchin is not a crazy person, right? He's a, he's a, uh, a reasonably rational actor. And he looks at this situation and he's got to know all the things that you just said. Um, and for some reason, there isn't a, you know, a intense Bunsen burner torqued under his ass about this. And I just don't understand that. Like, I, so, okay, maybe Mitch McConnell is delusional and is blinded by ideology, but the Secretary of the Treasury has a whole building full of people who were telling him exactly what you're saying, because what you're saying is economic orthodoxy. And why is it that the Secretary of the Treasury doesn't have a sense of urgency about, you know, gee, if we don't get some money in the hands of the, the big states, they're going to start laying off uh, all kinds of workers who are then going to not spend money, who are then going to not be, you know, buying things uh, and who are going to start hoarding, you know, uh, uh, you know, being extremely conservative in their spending, which is what we learned in the 30s. Right. Sends the paradox every, of thrift, yeah. Everybody behaving rationally becomes an economic depression. Like, how is Steve Mnuchin not going up and begging Nancy Pelosi, please, please spend as much money as you want, put money in the hands of every homeless person at extremely irresponsible rates so that they can spend it on whatever they want, including drugs. Um, what, 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 why is he not doing this? Uh, my perception and I, you know, I, I'm not in, in the room where it happens, so I don't know, but my perception is that of all of the various um, economic policymakers in this administration, Mnuchin seems most on board with let's get more money into the hands of Americans as, as quickly as possible, whatever form that may take. I don't know if that's going to be, you know, more Trump bucks, stimulus checks, or aid to the states um, that, you know, will filter down or, or what. Um, I think he is more on board with that just based on his public comments than some of the other folks like um, Larry Kudlow or outside advisor Stephen Moore, who gave some interview either today or yesterday where he was saying that he's like trying to start a movement to, um, I forget the, how he, what the branding was, but it was something about like getting rid of wasteful government spending, you know, it's like, this is, not, not the time to be worried about that. He's st again, he still wants tax cuts, but um, you know, on the other side of the ledger, not so much. So I, I think Mnuchin of all of that cast of characters is probably most on board, but I don't know. Um, you know, the other thing that I should mention about your question on Mitch McConnell is some of this could be posturing. You know, they're trying to get other stuff through, including some sort of legislation that would give some form of blanket liability to corporations um, if their employees come back and people get sick or their customers get sick, things like that. So some of this could just be um, playing hardball. You know, he secretly wants uh, there to be another round of stimulus, but is trying to get as many concessions out of the Democrats as possible. I don't know. Um, I think that's a, a plausible story for what's going on. And and that may be what the strategy is within the White House as well. But you know, Trump is probably just listening to whoever he spoke to last. So if that was Mnuchin, um, maybe he wants to spend more money because you know Trump has never been one to care about deficits, by the way. Although some of these other figures like intermittently claim to, um, at least when the subject is not tax cuts. So, but then you know maybe. Stephen Moore comes in and says, uh, hey, we shouldn't be spending more money. Um, and then Trump is on board with that. So I don't know. Um, I, I just, I hope that they act soon because there's sort of this ticking time bomb with these unemployment benefits ending, or at least the expanded, the enhanced unemployment benefits 
ending soon. And as I said, a lot of states um, coming up with a new coming upon a new fiscal year. So Catherine, you referred to it twice as the Great Recession, and I love that. And I'm certainly not new. And it's like, but I would say that it's not that I don't I don't hear everyone referring it to it as that. Um, and it kind of reminds me of people referring to the Great War until there was World War II. Um, and so now I feel like we're in the World War II of the Great Recession. <laughs> like, like, it's like, Perhaps. it's not the Great War anymore. Now it's just a number. <laughs> great War number two. <laughs> and so like, um, do you, do you think that that's accurate? Also, I do, before we get to like a bunch of like, we have so many reader, uh, listener questions that we're going to get to, but like, I really want to talk geek out about like theater with you for like okay. a second too. Um, if you have time, but first I kind of want to get your take on the great recession that we can like pivot. Sure. Um, that's an interesting question about the branding here. Um, I don't know what this period is going to be known as. I remember when people first started using the nickname Great Recession, um, which was probably 2008 or so, I did like a LexisNexis search and found that basically every prior recession of the past 30 or Gets some called odd the years Great Recession, has, yeah. Has been called the Great Recession at some point, but it really only stuck. Uh, for the recession that officially went from December 2007 to June 2009. Um, and uh, if you look at the trends this time around, uh, the losses to GDP, to hiring, you know, net hiring, net payrolls, to basically every major metric you can find are just so much sharper, so much deeper, so much faster this time around. They, they put the, the greatness of the Great Recession to shame. Of course, we may already even be out of this recession, technically. Um, it may be, be, we already saw new hiring, right? right. The, re the term yeah. recession, it's a little bit confusing. The way that economists use the term recession, it's about the direction of trends, not their levels. So, if the direction of hiring turns upward, but it's still really depressed, right? It's still like the number of jobs is low, but it's increasing. Technically, that could mean you're not in a recession. You've already had a turnaround, even if things feel really sucky. Um, it's again, it's about- It's not about race. consumer confidence. It's literally not receding. Yes, exactly, it's just exactly. receded quickly to a very ugly place. Yeah, yes. perfectly put, Ben, yes. So the, um, the official arbiter of recession dates is the National Bureau of Economic Research. They have this like team of elite economists who look at all the different indicators and they say, aha, it looks like everything started moving downward in that month. Let's say, you know, based on the weight of the evidence, it looks like that's when the business cycle turned and we, had, we started receding, we had the recession. Um, and they officially declared that the, the um, recovery ended and the recession began in February of this year. It was, I think it was the fastest they have ever slapped the label on, you know, identifying- This is a recession, point. this yeah. is a recovery, Normally, yeah. Normally it takes like six months to a year when they say, okay, in retrospect, we can see that, like we knew things were kind of bad recently, but we can see that the turning point was then, was the, was in December, 2007, for example. This time- But I'm confused said, about that, yeah. Catherine. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that technical definition of a recession involved economic contraction for two quarters or more, right? So, and the reason that, for the reason for the lag had to do with you could see that things might be receding right now but you don't know when it started and you don't know how long it's going to go on so they wait to apply the term recession until they know there are two quarters so the two quarters of negative gdp growth or you know uh, output contraction whatever you want to call it that is a commonly used sort of loose definition in the United States, the official dates are not based solely on GDP growth. They're based on basically all of the major indicators. And it's, again, it's this one group we have, I don't know if any other countries do it this way, um, but in the United States, it's this very specific group that says th these are the dates. And, you know, one question that people, that economists and economics journalists have been raising recently is, 
hmm, even if the NBER business cycle dating committee labeled the beginning of the recession, um, you know, at the, with the shortest lag ever, they still may have very well labeled it after the recession ended. Because again, it's possible that we already had the turning point um, in May. We don't know. I mean, they, they haven't determined that yet. And my guess is that they will wait longer um, to, to designate the end of the recession than they did the beginning of the recession. Because it was like a really clear cut Everything shut down. Everyone lost their jobs starting around February or March. You can see when it started, but but we don't know how long this is going to drag on. Maybe the good, you know, good, um, better than expected jobs report that we got in May was a dead cat bounce. Um, you know, maybe things will go back down if, if if hiring will go back down in the months ahead. You know, it's I think it stagnate. Yeah, it could. Yeah, we don't know. It depends on how many more cases of illness there are. It depends on how comfortable consumers feel going out and resuming normal activities, normal economic activities, going to restaurants, going to supermarkets, etc. So um, it could be that we're out of the recession, but it could be that it'll drag on for a while. And it kind of we had this false start that that didn't actually take hold, especially again, if you have suddenly all of these states laying off millions of workers and all sorts so of before i let stuff. kate uh detour onto a geek out on theater i actually want to talk to you a little bit about your career okay because um one thing i hear all the time from lots of people is that you know it's basically impossible for young people to break into journalism now and um whenever i hear that um i always talk about you. Not that, you know, you're, you're still young, but you're, you're somebody I'm an who, old lady now. It's okay. Yeah. Well, you're, you know, you, you're, you're Kate's age. Um, uh, but you waltzed in, in roughly the worst moment in journalism. Um, and you've never done anything else. And so my question is, first of all, Tell us a little bit about your career and how you came to be what you are. Mm -hmm. But secondly, is it all bullshit? And that basically the, the journalism economy is over. There's no way to get a career started. It is, is basically nonsense. And you just have to be uh, aggressive and entrepreneurial and good. And there's still a lot of opportunity. Or is it somewhere in between? I think in my case, I, in, in many ways, I got very lucky. So superficially, it may look like I should have been screwed over because I graduated in 2007 and news organizations were already like in structural decline. And then they were in cyclical decline because we had this recession and there, there were no jobs and, um, in some sense, the industry was really hard to break into, but in some sense, it was actually advantageous for me because I knew something about economics. <laughs> and um, I, I started as an intern at the Washington Post, as you said. Well, I don't know if you actually ex explicitly said that, but that's how we met, right? Um, that's the, that was the, the one yeah, day Yeah, you showed up in the office one day. Yeah, right. Um, so I was an intern at the Washington Post, um, and uh, I got my internship extended a few times while people were on book leave or medical leave or whatever. Um, and I was not sure I was ever going to have a permanent job, and it was not clear that the Post was in a position to give me a permanent job. Um, I ended up leaving and taking a job at the Chronicle of Higher Education for a couple of minutes, basically. Um, but my big break was that the New York Times was looking for a journalist who knew something about economics. And at the time, there were almost none. Um, that has that since changed of necessity, right? But because we had a, a recession and a lot of journalists kind of boned up on 
on economic issues, but journalists, you know, are mostly like English majors or humanities majors or, or what have you and are really terrified of numbers. Um, not all, but, you know, if I want to stereotype, uh, most journalists are, you know, they're, they're, they're more left brain, right? Is that, is that the right? I don't know. Well, they're, they're part of the brain that deals with language, not, not with numbers. Um, and, and social skills. And social skills. Um, and the Times was starting this economics blog. The guy who was then the economics columnist, who, who is now uh, an op-ed columnist, David Leonhardt, emailed a bunch of economists that he knew and asked, do any of you know any young journalists or something who might have some facility with this or whatever? I don't remember. I don't know exactly what the query was, but I happen to have worked for an economist in college, Alan Kruger, who um, passed away last year. And my work for him was not related to my ambitions as a journalist, although he, you know, he had been writing some guest um, pieces for the Times, but that's not why I ended up working for him. And he gave them my name. And so look, for me, the stars aligned. And most people are not going to be well, are not going to ha happen to have had that level of serendipity. So I don't mean to like, and, and I also, you know, I went to a fancy college and stuff, which also put, which also gave me a lot of advantages um, and networks and things like that. So yeah, I worked really hard. I did internships throughout high school and throughout college. I freelanced, I wrote for the school paper, all of that good stuff. But had I not kind of happened to have had the right subject matter expect expertise for that moment, you know, who knows if I would be in this business. So I, I, yeah, so I just want to say that I think, you know, I've always, one of the reasons I, this is maybe a little bit egocentric, but one of the reasons I always focus on you when people tell me, you know, there's no opportunity in journalism anymore is that your career so closely resembles mine except in a with a completely different subject matter mm -hmm. um i've always been convinced that the reason i was able to function in journalism is that i just i knew a lot of law that other journalists don't know and you're just telling a story of like well you know the new york times needed somebody who actually knew something about economics and i was the appropriate 23 year old for that that project and i i think the big lesson of that story which I wish people would hear is generalism is fucking overrated. I and, agree with that. You know, like know something about economics, know something about law, know something about engineering, you know, know something about like like the ability to 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 actually walk into a room where something is happening and be able to engage with the people in it, if not quite as peers, at least as a, a highly, highly informed observer is a really underrated thing in, in the industry, but it's valued where it counts, which is when, when people actually need something, somebody who can do something, they do know that Catherine Rampel is different from the thousand other bright young people who graduated within the last few years. Yeah, and, and generally the advice that I give to young aspiring journalists, college journalists, people like that, when they ask me what they should do is know something about something. And in particular, more technical subject matters. Law had not occurred to me as, as an example, but, the, but that is also a good example. Usually I say, you know, know some, learn something about economics, finance, science, medicine, um, engineering, another good example. These are areas where, again, most journalists are not going to have a lot of subject matter expertise. They may not be comfortable learning about these technical areas. And there are always shortages. I mean, even in, in an industry where there are basically negative job openings they always need people who know some who know how to talk about you know whatever scientific breakthroughs are going on or um you know what the supreme court did i guess you know there's a, a lot of sort of jargon that's difficult 
to penetrate. The indicator for, yeah, the indicator for me in this is like how much effort I have to put into preparing for a conversation Mm -hmm. or to give a talk or to like have a talk with a journalist about something. And as my career has progressed, it has just become this gradual decline in like any type of preparation (laughs) necessary, which has just, and I don't mean that because like, I don't know anything. It's actually the opposite. It's just like, no, I'm like, I'm pretty much like I have most of the knowledge and like the kind of, and like the scope of the field of internet, like free speech and like everything that's going on at the platforms and at the, like the government level. If I don't, I can just say I don't. And that's also something I've gotten really fine with being able to say Mm -hmm. and think is really healthy to be like, oh, I have no idea about that, which is like way better than trying to bullshit your way through something. But like what I do find like what the, I don't know. So I want to pivot to kind of like talking about theater very quickly before we go to like the, the the questions. But um, I was, I just was generally kind of thinking that like, yeah, there's kind of a moment now that I have when people assign some type of, someone comes to me and is like, do you want to write about this? And I'm like, if it feels like it's going to be a ton of work, I just know that it's not in my bailiwick and it's not something I should be doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel that way, Catherine, like you probably have to like, um, then we will mute Lou. Oh, good. Okay. Um, okay. Really quick theater question. Mm -hmm. What is like, are you a musical theater person or a theater theater person or tell us like, And if you had to pick the last, in the last kind of year of things that you've seen, what are the top things that you've seen? Um, So I love musicals. Uh, I love straight plays too, but I love musicals. I was in my college musical theater troupe where we wrote and produced and toured our own shows. I'm very proud of my- Very fancy. Princeton Triangle Club roots. and I actually, I still have friends from that group who are like still working in theater in some capacity who are doing awesome stuff. So um, it's, it, you know, I, I'm no longer writing. I, I no longer have like any direct connection to theater. I'm not writing reviews. I'm not, you know, writing silly songs or whatever, but I feel like I get to live vicariously through them. And I still go, well, now I'm not going to plays <laughs> because um, for obvious reasons, there are death traps apparently right now. Um, but of the things that I've seen in the last year, um, Soft Power, which is a musical by David Henry Huang and um, 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 what's her name, who wrote Violet. Um, it's going to drive me nuts. I'm looking it up. Uh, but that was at the Public Theater. Uh, Janine's a story. There we go. Um, That was at the public theater and was phenomenal. It was, it was basically both a parody of tropes within American musicals about Asia and, you know, sort of the uh, Orientalist, um, I don't know. King and I type King, of like. Yeah, there's a lot of like King and I references. So it's there, it's an inver- inversion of a lot of those kinds of tropes, but also a satire about America. <laughs> um, basically, it's about um, the, it's bookended by this true real life story where David Henry Huang, who's the playwright, was the victim of a hate crime in New York. I think he was, he was stabbed. Um, randomly by it mistaken for like a Chinese delivery guy or something. Um, they never solved the crime, but anyway, that's, that's bookended. And then he has this sort of fantasy while he's in the hospital about how he's been asked to write a musical for a Chinese audience that like does all of the things, and again, an inversion of all of the things that you have in these uh, Western fantasies where like, the white person goes to Asia here. It's the Asian person, in this case, a Chinese person comes to America and is like, you know, there gets all sorts of things wrong, but it, it's also a satire of democracy. And like, how, do, how, if you lived in an autocratic nation, how would you view 
the dysfunction of America and our problems with gun violence and things like that. I don't, I'm not doing it justice, but it was. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, it was almost an entirely um, Asian American cast with the exception of, I think, just one person who played Hillary Clinton. It, the, uh, the premise in this, um, in this like imagined musical um, is that the guy from China becomes the advisor to Hillary Clinton in the same way that uh, Anna becomes the advisor to the King of Siam in The King and I, and is like trying to civil, you know, rather than trying to civilize you know, the Siamese, the Thais. When I was in eighth I grade, I was in a production America. of The King and I, in which we did full body paint. You know, it's someday, really Kate, the pictures of that are going to emerge to yep, de I know. destroy your life. Um, probably. <laughs> 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 in this environment. Um, there was a no actually, the last thing that I saw before all of the theaters got shut, shut down was also at the public theater. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, but I'm looking it up. I was okay. going to tell you that you should have seen at St. Anne's the ham, the production of Hamlet with um, Ruth uh, Negra mm -hmm. as Hamlet. It was absolutely brilliant. I don't know if you, and it was, she was I amazing. It. it was really good. Oh, the last thing that I saw, well, if it comes back, I will keep an eye out for it. Um, was it what, was it running when stuff closed, shut down? It was like was in February. It was like literally like a, like a two week run in February and then it, like everything shut down. Um, the last thing I saw was also at the public theater and it was called Coal Country. And it was, it's, it's a, um, one of these pieces of documentary theater where they interviewed the, um, family members of people who died in the 2010 Upper Big Branch, um, West Virginia mine disaster. Yeah. And um, it's a musical. It was also music. Well, they had some music, um, I should say. But uh, that was really moving. And um, I saw that, I think, two days before all the theater shut down. And it, I'll be very sad if that doesn't have a longer life. But it was it was really good. No, that's great to know. So let's take some questions. Uh, Rachel, unmute yourself. The floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Sure can. yep. Hi. So my question is, uh, what does the situation look like internationally? So in Europe and in China, um, their numbers for COVID look a lot healthier. Is their economic recovery also looking healthier? Or um, yeah, what are they doing? Um, so, you know, in some sense, it's a little bit hard to compare job markets because the um, policy response has been so different here versus in Europe. So in Europe, there's been much more of a focus on keeping people on payrolls, whether that means the government directly pays essentially for workers um, or, or there are policies that have... Um, the, the German word for it is Kurzarbeit. It's like shared work, basically um, a coordinated effort to have more people work part-time rather than having discrete layoffs of some workers. So there have been more policies that are focused on keeping people employed. So in a lot of countries, they have had fewer layoffs than here, where we do have this paycheck protection program, which is not totally functional, but is supposed to be keeping people on payrolls, but we've had a much more, a much bigger response, I would argue, um, with unemployment insurance. Um, so those people are gonna get counted as unemployed rather than working. So it's a, li it's a little bit hard to like do an apples to apples comparison there. If you look at um, the GDP numbers, I think that the OECD had a report that came out earlier this week where they were estimating or they were projecting like how bad the damage was going to be. And I think we were kind of in the middle of the pack among developed countries in terms of um, how much GDP we had lost and what the forecasts were going forward. But to be honest, I haven't looked, I haven't dug into the exact numbers. Um, it does seem like in other countries, they have at least more of a plan for figuring out how to reopen safely and mitigate risk. And here we're just kind of winging it. Um, I mean, it, I guess it depends on what state and city you live in, but other countries have done a better job at contact tracing, 
um, you know, they had more testing early on. We, we have a, a lot more testing available now, but they have, they, it seems like they built more of the infrastructure that would be needed to like help resume economic activity. And to me, that suggests that that, that kind of planning is going to make their recoveries better um, than ours. But with so much is unknown about the path of this virus that it's hard to say. Ray Bond, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, Catherine. Um, so it seems to me like Jay Powell and the Fed have been uh, targeting uh, targeting stock market indices in ways that um, other monetary policy hasn't. Uh, I may be off base on that, but to the extent that that's true, how much do you think that is impacting the dynamics of the market and the uh, very quick V-shaped recovery that we've seen up, up until now? And then also, has uh, Larry Kudlow ever been right about anything of substance? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, on the Fed, I mean, the Fed has limited ammunition. They, they've used a lot more ammunition than I had given them credit for in the early days. I remember um, when they, I'm trying to remember what it was that they announced initially but i was like there we go they shot all their bullets like it's up to the it's up to the legislature now to pass some fiscal policy and then they kept on doing more and more and more and more and i was like wow they're being way more creative than i had expected they're doing all sorts of things that they didn't even think to do during the great recession which you know maybe as we just discussed, oh, ever been right about anything of substance <laughs> <laughs> um so in, in any case, uh, I don't think that it's fair to say that the Fed is just targeting the stock market. They also have their Main Street lending facility that they're opening. They're doing a lot of different things. They, they cut interest rates, um, which helps not only the stock market, but you know people who want to buy mortgages and things like that. So I don't think that's quite fair. Um, but they also don't have the capacity to use tools that are really needed to help, you know, to, to more directly help the regular Joe, which is fiscal policy, right? They can't, like, they're not going to do helicopter drops of money um, as, as much as people might ask them to. That's really the realm of, of Congress to pass st more stimulus bills. Uh, on Kudlow, yeah, Kudlow's wrong about basically everything. He's a very congenial guy. He's very charming. Um, I've met him before, and I hold no personal grudge against him, but he's just wrong all the time and seems to not care at all about preserving his or anyone else's credibility, which I think is a precious commodity in a crisis. He made some comment either today or yesterday about how um, Jay Powell should smile more, something like that. Like the, the reason why markets were freaking out yesterday, and I don't know what's going on with markets, by the way, like they're, it, it, there's so much volatility and you know, animal spirits. I don't know what, what's driving them up or down on any given day. Some, it seems like it's an, often an overreaction to some little bit of news about a vaccine or a little bit of news about a negative forecast or whatever. I don't know. I don't think it's Jay Powell's fault that markets fell yesterday, but for some reason, Kudlow seemed to think it was and said that Kudlow, I said that rather um, Powell should um, smile more and should get some media training. This is from the guy. Who That's what Kate court. always says about me. Yeah. I you mean, this is, yeah, smile this, more, Ben. <laughs> this is from the guy who said that the virus was contained and that people right. should buy the dip um, right before markets fell like 20%. So I'm not really going to take media training advice or advice on any substance from Cudlow. Lou, you have a question. Unmute yourself. Last chance. All right, lose questions. Oh, oh nope. there he is. Go um, for it. Yeah, so I'm not sure how true this is, but there's uh, maybe a conjecture that Mitch McConnell doesn't want to spend money in the municipalities and cities because he sort of wants to starve the beast, so to speak. Is that reasonable to think that? So, um, so this whole concept of starving the beast has been around for decades. And, um, you know, this, this was supposedly the Republican strategy 
I think starting back in the 80s. I don't know when when the term was first coined, but sometime around there. Probably never- around the same time as Star Wars. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, and it never actually happens, right? Um, in part, we co- by it never happening, I mean, even if we um, cut tax revenue, which is, I think, usually the context in which that term is used, that if we cut tax revenue, then that means... Um, there won't be any money to play with to spend on stuff. Um, you, you starve the beast so that the beast can't grow, or however the metaphor might be elaborated upon. Um, but that hasn't actually happened. We just end up borrowing more. Um, you know, the United States is in this privileged position where we can borrow, if not indefinitely, uh, a, at least a lot more than other countries can because we have the world's reserve currency. Treasuries are considered the safest of safe assets. So even if we cut tax revenues, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be so constrained on how much we can spend. Now, you know, th- what's the expression that if something can't go on forever, it won't? <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that this will be the case forever. But Republicans keep cutting taxes, and yet somehow they also keep spending more money. Under Trump, um, deficits were going way up even before the pandemic not only because they cut $2 trillion of tax revenue over a decade, um, but also because, you know, under Trump, both Democrats and Republicans decided to pass budgets that increased spending on defense and and non-defense priorities. So I don't exactly know how that would fit into Mitch McConnell's thinking here. Um, Like I said, you know, he, he may be ideologically committed to less government services in general, um, independent of what, however many tax, however much we have in tax revenues coming in. And, you know, if you really want to be conspiratorial about it, one could argue, well, the more dysfunctional government looks because of layoffs, uh, the more anti-government sentiment there is, and therefore the more support for more government layoffs. I think this is sort of a, a problem that like the postal service has faced that the postal service, um, as it has, financial difficulties, some born of, you know, policies unique to the, to the financial service and not some sort of like, you know, having to do with pensions and things like that, but uh, not, not some sort of like Republican con- uh, conspiracy. People like hate the postal service and they're like, yeah, well, maybe, maybe they don't need more money. Maybe they don't need a bailout, et cetera. I don't know that the, the, not, the not to like go off on the postal yeah. service metaphor, but like someone recently on Twitter, I saw like basically described the current times as we were in as like a Jane Austen novel in which we basically like hope every day includes a brisk walk and a delivery from the, from like the post office. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I kind of think that that's a little bit what our life is like. Uh, so dunking on the, po- like we've dunked every day at Mitch McConnell but I don't want to dunk on the post office. I love the post office. Well, and now that I say that, I I should go back and look at the favorability ratings. Maybe people don't hate them as much as I think. Um, I I think the rule is people love the post office when it comes to them, Uh and they hate the post office when they have to go to it. That's true. Yes, yes. It's like like the DMV. Like like people like their mailman, Uh and people just hate going to the post office. Yeah. Um, so Catherine, we are out of time. Uh, it has been a great pleasure talking to you. And uh, I want to give you one question to uh, leave us with, which is, um, what should we be looking for in the next few weeks? What are you looking for in terms of signa? Uh, sort of indicators of where things are heading? Is it, if it's not employment data, like what are the indicators that you're really keeping your eye on as harbingers of what is to come? Um, so that's a good question. How many pork bellies? How, many, right. <laughs> How much frozen orange juice? Yeah, um, exactly. You know, I think indicators like how many people are working part-time involuntarily will be interesting to follow because 
even if jobs are coming back, if those jobs aren't providing sufficient hours or they're lower pay, that's worth monitoring because it'll give you a sense of how strongly whatever the recovery we're in, if we're in a recovery, how- Or how sticky the job is. How sticky the job is. I mean, you know, I've heard anecdotally from people and I don't have a way of quantifying it, that there are people, for example, who had been a 1099 contractor somewhere who got hired on as a W-2 employee only through the end of, I guess, June, um, because the company that they were working for needed to get their headcount up for um, PPP loan forgiveness purposes. And so the question is, what happens after the end of June? Do these people who were brought on, who were counted as hires, because they weren't considered a hire before if they were a contractor for the purposes of the, the official jobs report, that's about payroll employees. Do they stay payroll employees? Do they go back? What do their hours look like? What does their pay look like? Those are the kinds of things that I want to be paying attention to, um, not just the headline number of how many jobs were added what's the quality of those jobs how to your to use your term how sticky are those jobs um so i'll be looking at that i'll be looking at what's happening with state finances and of course um this ongoing debate over relief for states and cities um what about then, consumer confidence indexes how much stock do you put in those catherine so the numbers that were released today were better than expected. And that's, a, I, or at least for, I think they were better than whatever the consensus had been or the consensus forecast had been. Um, and I think that's a good sign. The question is how useful are those softer survey data now? Because there's been some evidence over the past few years that how people respond to questions about the economy has become even more colored than it's always been by their partisan affiliation, right? That they overstate the quality of the economy if their guy is in, if their party's in office and they understate it if their party's out of office. Again, this has always been true to some extent, but the, um, the partisan lens through which those questions are answered has just gotten much, much stronger in the last few years. And so given that, like how politicized even discussion of the jobs report is, yeah. you know, Trump is tweeting about how it's the best jobs report ever. And it's like, well, again, better than expected, but also we're still like 20 million jobs in the hole or whatever it is. Um, yeah, so look, if you're going to have, if, if, if you lose 40 million jobs in a very short period of time, and gain a small fraction of them back, that's a lot of jobs. And you're gonna have a really good jobs report if you ignore the backdrop against which it's happening. Yeah. I think the important thing to pay attention to is what people are actually doing rather than what they're saying. This is always one of the lessons in economics, uh, you know, that it's, the economists use the term revealed preferences. Um, so I think it's more important to pay attention to are people actually spending money are they going to restaurants what what do bookings at you know at open ta on open table for example what do they look like rather than these sort of softer survey data about what people say that they're willing to do that's relevant too and it'll be perhaps more of a leading indicator um but in the end you you want to know if they're putting their money where their mouth is we're going to leave it there catherine thank you so much for joining us stay safe and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you, likewise. We it will, was so uh, fun to hang, meet you and hang out with you. Bye, bye, Catherine. Bye, hope to meet you in person sometime. Yeah. We will be back tomorrow at five. It'll be just Kate and me. We will plan the week. We will, uh, we will take some of the questions that were uh, directed not at Catherine, but at us today. Uh, particularly uh, if you guys want to talk about the Flynn case, which was argued today at the DC circuit. I'll go watch that. So I'm better. I listened to the whole argument and I wrote up a long piece on it for Lawfare, which will be up uh, this evening, but I'm also happy to chat about that tomorrow. Um, in the meantime, what do we say? If you can't have fun anymore in lieu of fun, 
Wait, I fucked it up. That's not how it goes. <laughs> that was right. Oh, that was? Darn yeah. it. Okay, if you can't have fun anymore in lieu of fun, come hang out with us and talk about your lack of confidence in the economy. Excellent. We <laughs>